Um, so uh, welcome for everybody trickling in uh, to the webinar right now. Uh, my name is Oliver Rosales. I'm a professor of history uh, here at Bakersfield College, and I'm super excited uh, to host and welcome our speaker for today, uh, Lloyd Barba. Uh, but before uh, we do, I, I just want to uh, thank uh, the folks at Bakersfield College uh, events for helping to facilitate and organize uh, the logistics behind the webinar. Uh, shout out to our uh, to Kim, our, our, trans, our transcriber here. Um, the talk today is being recorded and will be archived on the, the Bakersfield College Social Justice YouTube page, uh, which has a great archive of talks from academics across uh, the United States who have done uh, work and research on the Central Valley, particularly farm workers. So we're super excited to have uh, Professor Barba joined that, that archive that we're building. And a big shout out to, to Digital Ethnic Futures um, out of um, uh, the Mellon Foundation and, and Brown University for, for co-sponsoring uh, this speaker event series. Um, and then for anybody who's who's in the, the audience too, I'll say that um, we have two other speakers who are gonna be part of this series. Um, uh, Ella Diaz from San Jose State will be speaking over the summer about her work on, on the Chicano arts movement and the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and we also have Jennifer Terry from UC Berkeley uh, who will be speaking about her research on child activists in the United Farm Workers. So Lloyd is, is kicking off uh, this subject. Uh, so again, um, thank you Lloyd for being here. And I'm gonna introduce Lloyd by reading his uh, bio from his, his brand new book, which he's gonna talk about today. Uh, Lloyd Daniel Barbara is Assistant Professor of Religion and Core Faculty in Latinx and Latin American uh, Studies at Amherst College. Uh, he has published essays on the history of race and religion, Pentecostalism, Catholicism, the Sanctuary Movement, and Material uh, Religion. He earned his BA in History and Religion from the University of the Pacific, and his PhD in American culture from the University of Michigan. And not in his bio, uh, but I jokingly told him at the outset, his partner, Ruth Barba, uh, has a brand new book out as well on the history of Weed Patch and the Sunset Labor Camp area, and actually collaborated with our former chancellor at the Kern Community College District a little bit with the project, uh, Jim Young. So uh, we welcome both Barbas here. <laughs> so I, other than that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Lloyd, to take it away. And I'll just say for everybody, the logistics, I've told Professor Barba to speak about his book for about 30 to 45 minutes, and we'll save time for um, Q&A at the end. So if you have questions along the way, feel free to populate that and we'll address it in the Q&A portion. But welcome, uh, Lloyd Barba. Great. Dr. Rosales, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to jump over to the to the uh, screen share and PowerPoint here in a bit, but I'll start off by saying it feels good to be uh, talking to and you know addressing folks from the Central Valley, um, born and raised um, in the Stockton area, and spent many years in Stockton proper, uh, having gone uh, to Del San Joaquin Delta Community College there for about uh, a year and some change, then over to the University of Pacific. So Central Valley is a place that's near and dear to my heart. And I spent a good portion of the year there, actually in the Bakersfield area between Bakersfield and Arvin. And so, well, I'll just make myself right at home and uh, comfortable and uh, jump into the talk here. So, all right. I hear that PowerPoint doesn't work unless you say I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. Okay, so Sewing the Sacred. Um, it's here's the book, folks. Sewing the Sacred: Mexican Pentecostal Farm Workers in California. The book doesn't have the years on it, but these are truly the years uh, covered in the book from 1916 and 1966. Um, I'll tell you more about a uh, bit about the process of writing the book itself um, in a bit on one of the slides. But um, yeah, so I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, launch right into it. And again, thank you, Dr. Oliver Rosales, for the opportunity to speak. Okay, so um, the way I structured this book talk is giving uh, time mostly to um, stories in the chapter. So I conducted oral histories, of, uh, about two dozen oral histories to uh, to write this book. And again, in, in telling history, I feel it's, just, it's the best way of articulating the content of the book and also telling you some, or sharing with you some of the stories that uh, some of the interviewees shared with me. So I'll go right on into it. Okay. 
So first, starting off with, uh, here we are in California. So there's historical context, Pentecostalism. Um, so first thing first, um, you know, the, the, the book is Mexican Pentecostal Farm Workers, and there's a little bit of context to do around those different terms. First, to start off, what is Pentecostalism? Um, it's a much more far-reaching and diverse movement, as I'll describe here in the book. But for the purposes of the years that I discussed, 1916 and 1966, the sort of uh, prehistory or the precursor to the movement of Mexican Pentecostals owes its roots to the Azusa Faith Mission. So folks may have heard of the Azusa Street Revival. Long story short, um, historians say that Pentecostalism has its um, its roots in the Midwest, and it gets its global expression through a revival in Los Angeles. And another metaphor that's used is the birth of Pentecostalism is in the Midwest, somewhere between Kansas and Texas and some revivals around 1901. And in 1906, the beginning of this, uh, of this um, Azusa Street Revival at the Azusa Faith Mission in 1906, that is the cradle of, of the global Pentecostal movement. And as you see, the uh, movement was uh, spearheaded in Los Angeles by an interracial uh, board of leaders. Um, at the helm of the movement was William Seymour, who you see here uh, seated. Um, I don't know if you're able to see the cursor, but um, marking him right there where he is in the photo. Okay. <clears throat> this is, other than when, the time I gave a talk at the University of the Pacific, my alma mater, this is... Um, one of the few times I don't have to do a whole lot of explaining of what the Central Valley is, what the San Joaquin Valley is. So um, I will just add a few more bits here about where the book takes place. So the majority of it is in the Central Valley. And a lot of the stories um, take place in the Central Valley. People I talked to were from the Central Valley and were farm workers in the valleys. Importantly, there's also places, right? There's smaller valleys throughout. So you have um, here, south of the San Francisco area, at the Pajaro Valley, Salinas Valley, Santa Clara Valley. Um, moving further south, so I mark in point five here, the Citrus Belt. That encompasses the San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, and the Los Angeles Basin. So when Orange County meant Orange County, because there's oranges, right? Um, not orange um, due to bad tans, um, but it meant something truly then. Also, as well as Oxnard, again, where we have uh, you know, a lot of berries that are produced there. But importantly, I want to draw your attention to this, this area right here, what I call the Tri-Valley um, Binational Region. So here we have the Imperial Valley, the Salton Sea right just north of it, and the Coachella Valley. Um, you know, once upon a time, before all the concerts and outdoor festivities, there were these um, Pentecostal revivals in the Coachella Valley. But um, right here, we know uh, number three, that is the southernmost valley. So it's the Imperial Valley. At the time that the book was, um, the, the time that the book covers, uh, right over a line in the sand is the Mexicali Valley. So they were technically in Mexico. Um, just to the east of the, of, the, of the Imperial Valley, you had the Gila River Valley, which is Yuma, uh, Arizona, and some of these surrounding towns and cities. Okay, so that's just to orient you. Uh, you'll see a lot of places you, you're familiar with, um, especially on point number seven, the Southern San Joaquin Valley, are in Bakersfield, Button Willow, Delano, La Manche, after Moscow. Um, I imagine that there are a lot of folks on this uh, webinar who are from these areas. Okay, continuing on. So a bit on the historical context of Pentecostalism, just to get back to it uh, very quickly. Um, so in these early years, uh, many regarded Pentecostalism to be an especially distasteful new sect, rife with cultish and fanatic tendencies. And there I'm using some terms of the day. So um, who would have balked at the uh, rise of Pentecostalism? Um, at the time, um, fundamentalists, um, Christian fundamentalists, uh, mainline Protestants as well, seeing Pentecostalism as an expression that doesn't really belong, you know, in modern time. Um, Fundamentalists would have, um, who I already mentioned, right, they would have uh, thought um, Pentecostals in their idea of like working miracles, speaking in tongues, they're mainly cessationists, right? So they would have thought, oh, no, that, that stuff, that's to the Bible time. That's for Jesus and his followers. The working of miracles, the speaking in tongues, that doesn't belong in the uh, modern era. And there's also, again, they're transgressing the, all, a whole host of sensibilities, uh, religious and cultural. So one of them... Uh, there's one description, again, these are kind of more characteristics of, characteristic of 
many impressions about Pentecostalism. Some described it as disgusting, delusions and insanities, and the last vomit of Satan, which when I saw that, I realized, I don't know, Satan's pancita could also get sick, so he needs his, his round of Pepto-Bismol as well. But um, you can kind of see where this is going, right? This is a way of trying to uh, defame the movement, try to scandalize it. And there were early attempts at the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in 1906. Um, one of the earliest reports here from April 18th, 1906, reported a weird babble of tongue. And you probably, I don't know how well you can read it, but below it says, new sect of fanatics is breaking loose. Wild scene last night on Azusa Street. Again, this sort of sentiment is quite common as a way to scandalize the movement. Um, so why these caricatures? But the group that I'm talking about, Mexican Pentecostal farm workers who call themselves apostolicos, um, a few reasons, and I'm going to get to more of them in a second, but primarily why this, uh, this transgression of religious and cultural sensibilities, part of it has to do with the idea of speaking in tongues, what scholars call glossolalia, and uh, divine healings, they were core doctrines. It's not just, oh, they spoke on tongues, you know, on occasion, or they welcomed it, or they tolerated it. This is a cornerstone to their idea that the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, El Espíritu Santo, fills people. And when they do so, they speak in tongues as people did in, in the book of Acts. And also the fact that they believe that they can um, bring about divine healing also scandalized the minds of many, many at the time. Also, <clears throat> so again, there are Mexican Pentecostals who call themselves apostolicos, think apostolic. And so they say they're apostolic because they're imitating the apostles, Jesus' followers from the New Testament. And they say they're Pentecostal because they try to replicate the events that happened in on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of the book of Acts. So the group I study here, the apostolicos, they're theologically on the outer boundaries as well. They hail from what's um, the, the term eventually develops of oneness Pentecostalism. So in short, it's a rejection of the classical historical teaching of the trinity and one thing you learn in studying american religion any denial of the trinity puts you on the fast track to heterodoxy heterodoxy is a more neutral term uh, th their detractors would have said heresy and yeah that that's this is um it's no small issue to disagree with um the when the historic teaching of the trinity and the apostolics or the oneness pentecostals made the case that um you know, a, a, a teaching of the Bible, especially that's anchored in the Jewish, um, ancient uh, Jewish and Israelite line of thought, that would support more of this oneness position. So again, back and forth, I won't get too much into it. And importantly, when they baptize, as I'll show in chapter two, they don't baptize using the titles Father, Son, Holy Spirit, nor do they sprinkle, but one had to go down fully into the water, submerged. And sort of the performative language that they believe would, uh, heal them of, or would, would forgive them of their sins was baptism in the name of Jesus. You had to say in Jesus' name as he went down into the water, or as they would say back in the day in Spanish, in the nombre de Jesucristo. Okay, historical context, farm labor in California. This is perhaps one of the groups I have to do the least explaining to since you're in Bakersfield, you're in and around Bakersfield, right? You get this. So um, I'll just start off by, uh, again, briefly outlining some of the points here. So. Mexican farm workers became the dominant workforce in the Imperial Valley by World War I. Again, the Imperial Valley being that very southernmost valley. This is also the time that historian Natalia Molina refers to as the immigration regime from 1924 to 1965. This is the moment of isolationist, restrictive sort of mandates that the, that the U.S. operated under from an Immigration Act in 1924 to 1965. It's a time of containment. This is also the time of the Great Depression and the Mexican, or, and the Mexican repatriation. From 1929 and 36. So historians estimate that anywhere between a quarter to a third of Mexicans were repatriated, deported. And the way uh, historian George Sanchez puts it, even if it's you know a third to a quarter who were deported, every family had to confront the decision of whether to go back to Mexico. So some went under the pressure in the form that we call self-repatriation, but again, that's always due to state pressure. Um, in many cases, there are uh, U.S. citizens, natural born citizens in the U.S. who are also rounded up in these uh, repatriation efforts. What's important here as well, the Bracero program, right, from 1942 to 1964, a bi-national agreement between the U.S. 
Texas and Mexico to uh, initially, you can probably note the date, right? 1942. This is a way to fill the labor vacuum caused by World War II with many of the men uh, having to uh, be abroad or in training and, and in military service. Uh, Mexicans were brought in to fill in that labor vacuum. But the program proved very lucrative for industrial ag owners and operators that it continued until 1964. Even amidst, again, at this point, decades of criticism of, and of the program and an exploitation. <clears throat> also, important to know Operation Wetback, and this impacts the Central Valley. This goes from 1954 to 56. Again, another uh, major sweep um, to deport uh, Mexican, in large part, Mexican uh, workers. Importantly, folks, this point I cannot stress enough. This is before the founding of the United Farm Workers. So before Chavez and started the United Farm Workers before they brought about the important reforms. This is a period we're talking about in the book. And the photograph on the left shows uh, stoop laborers. And again, this is, that's a term that's used uh, quite intentionally here. And I'll uh, describe that a bit more in a second. Okay. So the historical context, farm labor in California. Um, there are racial scripts and popular sentiments of the day. Now, the idea of racial scripts is developed by historian Natalia Molina, who already quoted, um, were cited earlier. And she develops this to describe the idea that um, certain ethnic and racial groups, there's a script written out for them, basically. Um, so Mexicans become the sort of the quintessential ag labor, borrowing from a longer historical script, uh, preceding them in, in large numbers, the Japanese workers, especially Chinese workers in California, moving a bit out of the region, but the long uh, legacy uh, of enslaved labor in the South. So there's this idea that Mexicans are meant to be stoop laborers, right? It's kind of the, uh, the photo that I showed earlier, um, going back right there, stoop laborers. And that stoop laborers are biologically fit to do this kind of work. They're closer to the ground and all sorts of kind of you know, racist formulations around that. So some of the ideas of the day, one of them, is that uh, Mexican workers are like birds of a passage, never to settle. This one I saw over and over. One missionary from the Assemblies of God um, noted, they're like a floating population as they move from place to place to get work according to crops or fruits or vegetables. Uh, uh, UC Berkeley economist Paul Taylor, who did tons of interviews with Mexican workers, uh, ag owners, wrote, where there is no Mexican, there is no valley. This is also the period that historians refer to as the Mexican problem. So what informs the idea of the Mexican problem? It has a large part to do with the influx of Mexican workers um, and the idea that the state does not have the resources or willing to uh, roll out resources to accommodate for uh, you know, the, the economic circumstances that Mexicans find themselves in, in large part due to wage exploitation. So a, a parallel you have to this, I'll describe um, a bit more in a second, is in the 30s, there's also what develops, again, because of the migration of uh, migrants from um, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, parts of Kansas, the Oki migration, right? So what, this becomes deemed the Oki problem. And it's the same sort of thing, right? The state is overrun with its relief efforts. And there's also a, again, a line of this that a population comes to comprise a problem because they're just seen as outside of the mainstream. Also interesting, I find this one so fascinating because it's just really so terribly contradictory. Um, they had the perception that Mexicans were slow, indolent, and tractable people, not in quotes, and unlikely to organize. It made them an ideal or cheap labor force. I just find this so ironic, right? On the one hand, they want to say, oh, they're slow, they're, they're indolent workers, they're lazy, uh, but they're tractable, right? You can get them to do the work. And they're not likely to organize. Like, is that somehow very ironically makes them a, a, an ideal workforce. Really, what it's saying, if you're, if you're kind of reading against the grain here, is that um, they are in a system of industrial ag during this time, again, pre-reforms brought about by, um, by the UFW and later reforms. In this period, this is a time when industrial ag is at its um, worst of exploitations and inflicting uh, the human body. Okay. So what led to some of the questions in this project are um, this juxtaposed historical context. So photographs from the Farm Security Administration. So on the left, we have the image of the stoop labor, right? Stooped over, uh, back-breaking work, 
And these photos showed stigmatization of farm workers as, again, the idea being that these are the lowest kind of labors. <clears throat> so you have, again, at the time, um, John Steinbeck's book, The Grapes of Wrath, um, Carrie McWilliams, who writes numerous books on the topic, and Dorothy Ling. I'm going to click here, and you're going to recognize the photo, I think, rather instantaneously. The efforts of these um, social reformers came, uh, bore most fruit when they were started to document the plight of the Dust Bowl or the Oki uh, migrants. The migrant mother, a photo taken by Dorothy Lang, was an iconic uh, symbol of the Great Depression. And so the, some, such as uh, Dorothy, um, Dorothy Lang and Paul Taylor, had started documenting the exploitation of Mexican laborers. But it really didn't register and gain sort of a national story and sympathy until the Oki laborers became the object of that photo documentary um, sort of um, activism. <clears throat> so we see this, the scandal of industrial ags abuses come apart with this. They, they come to light, right, because of this photo. And the photo, in many ways, it symbolizes the zeitgeist of Depression-era America. And what we really see as a calamitous fall of mid-stock white Americans in, or yeah, Midwestern white stock Americans into a stigmatized laboring force. The idea that they were next to Mexicans and Filipinos stooped over in the fields, that was scandalous for many, right? They didn't, they didn't seem to belong there. Now, what I found quite interesting was a, was a, um, a historian who noted that the photograph uh, taken of um, Florence Thompson, the migrant mother, was taken in the Pomo, California, the, uh, in the pea pickers camp. And this is the majority of Mexican workers who were, at, who were at the camp. So I thought, goodness, if the photographer had just panned over the camera, right, or angled it a little bit to the right, angled it a little bit to the left, you probably would have caught Mexican workers um, there. But again, that's not the story that captured the kind of attention. Okay. So today's book, today's talk, here is a question driving it after looking at that juxtaposed historical context. I ask what stories are portrayed about racialized Mexican workers and their religious life if we examine the photographs taken by the farm workers themselves. So in the photographs taken by the farm workers, I argue in the book that the sacred is articulated even in the context of decades of exploitation. And exploitation is it's in every single valley you go to. Um, it's again, one of the, sadly, it's one of the most notable features of farm labor is the rife exploitation. The millions of Mexicans who labored out in the fields, um, and uh, you know, the, the fact that there's so many of them, right, who work in the field, Mexicans become the dominant labor force of, 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 um, of farm laborers. That should really prove us to consider ample room for moments of resistance against the norms and the dictates of industrial ag. So when I say farm workers, again, I'm describing a particular category of workers here, right? If your idea of the yeoman farmer that wakes up in the morning, they can hear Paul Harvey's God Made a Farmer commercial, right, or advertising back in the day. He wakes up and, you know, you know, uses a tractor to, and, and harvests the, 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 the fields and feeds his family, kind of the subsistence farming, right? That's not what we're talking about in industrial ag. And I don't got to remind people in Bakersfield of that. We're talking about a system in which that category has faded, and it's faded somewhere between farm workers, the exploited class that's always on the go, that is moved from one place to the next, um, and farm operators uh, who occupy the upper strata of this um, this context. Okay. So in, in the book, I argue that although growers in California created a vast labor system uh, that was designed to maintain a disempowered workforce, farm workers resisted in many sacred ways. And I track the different sacred ways in this book. Okay. The majority of farm workers that I look at in this book Hail from this uh, denomination called La Asamblea Apostolica de la Fe en Cristo Jesús, or the Apostolic Assembly of Faith in Christ Jesus. They just like the term apostolicos. And so you see the, um, the photograph of the commemorative volume there. And so, again, how is it that a Mexican denomination founded, and com founded by and comprised largely Mexican farm workers took deep root across California's valleys and flourished? And this happened because of, not in spite of, industrial ag, a system designed to keep them on the go, right? Deracinated, uprooted, and to keep them as a cheap labor force. And I'm, I hope to show in a couple of different ways in which um, 
you know, when a story of the day might have to just seen them as a worker who's tossed to and fro, according to the dictates of industrial ag and all sort of macro forces of the new crop here, bringing in laborers for, you know, this the same period of time or another. There's intention, there's agency, there's meaning and creativity behind how many of these apostolic farm workers migrated from one valley to the next. So let's survey this land and this text here. Okay. Um, so in this uh, chapter, oh, really in the introduction, but as well as chapter one, I map out what I mean that by the profane. So if you've taken a course um, in humanities or in, in especially in religious studies, you may have heard of the sort of classical dichotomy of there's a sacred and there's, there's a profane, right? The profane is that which is happening outside of the temple. But my idea of profane, because of this context, it rests not on the, you know, this dichotomy, right? Profane and sacred. Rather, my idea of profane rests on Mexican workers in the worst. Think exploitative, dirty, sickness-inducing, fatal, dispossessed, stigmatized, et cetera. Line of labor in California at the time and all of the uh, physical and social repercussions of doing this kind of work. So throughout the, uh, the book and the talk, I use the term profane as a euphemism for the abundantly documented and notorious conditions that Mexicans face in industrial ag. So you could think the, um, the dirty, the sickness, um, uh, the environment, right, in which um, exploitation of, of, of wages, the dehumanization, biological reductionism, the delousing or sprain of DDT, fumigation, pesticide spraying while they're out in the fields, um, relegation of status as replaceable laborers, uh, very squalid housing um, circumstances, polluted water to which they had limited access even, and denial of cultural and legal citizenship, deportation, and all of its threats. So such a formulation of sacred efforts in this profane context led me to develop this idea of the sacralized profane. And that's how I understand of their sacred efforts in this profane environment. Okay, so when I get to this first chapter, uh, chapter one here, um, I'm gonna just give you snapshots, right, for each chapter. This is what I call sacred routes or mapping the church. And I was interested because I was reading this um, commemorative volume. This is a Jubilee volume or the, the semi-centennial volume, right, from 1960 to 1966. And um, as you open up the uh, volume, there's, a list of churches that are founded, right? A church in Oxnard in 1917, a church in Watts, 1917, uh, Riverside, 1918. Then there's a dramatic shift in the vocabulary, the tone, the expression into something like this, as you see here on the slide. So this documents uh, the, um, the wonderings, if you will, of the patriarch, the main leader of this denomination. He, he became sort of the organizational genius he led the Apostolic Assembly for decades and decades. So there's this story that's written. At the end of 1919, Brother Nava, after he was ordained and commissioned to Yuma, Arizona, opted to take Ramon Ocampo, a layman desired to work in the ministry. After arriving in Yuma and performing manual labor, they began to testify and arrived at the home of Brother Nava's sister named Guadalupe Sanchez. They saw that she was ill with a very advanced cancer of such extent that her face had been disfigured. They prayed for her and God performed a miracle of healing her. And because of this testimony and power of Christ, many people believed the apostolic doctrine among some of those believers were Protestants. Now the big fish folks would have been if it said among some of these believers were Catholics, but that's not how it turned out for them. Okay, just a story, Professor Barber, what's the big deal here? The intention, the, um, the fact that they can, they're not just workers again, tossed to and fro, but there's design here. And beyond that, the way that uh, the this uh, commemorative volume tells history. So <clears throat> I recall being in my office and reading through the commemorative volume. And at some point, uh, I have quite a bit of familiarity with um, the Bible, especially the New Testament. And at some point it hit me, this history they're telling sounds very familiar. And the fifth book of the New Testament is called the Acts of the Apostles. I started reading their history in different autobiographical accounts, biographies, and these commemorative volumes, and I was struck by the similarity between details of the Acts of the Apostles and the ways that the Apostolicals imagined themselves as a 20th century iteration of this early Christian church. And again, the idea of the Acts of the Apostolicals just hit me like a ton of bricks. So let's do some comparison here between 
the 14th chapter of the book of Acts and the 66th commemorative volume. Number one, Paul and his companion Barnabas traveled as a duo in Acts 14. In the commemorative volume, Nava and his protege, Ramon de Campo, traveled as a duo. Okay, big deal, Barbo. That's just a coincidence. Follow me, all right? In Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas headed to an unevangelized location. Ditto, Ramon Ocampo and Antonio Nava. Big deal, Barbara. It's not a big movement. Anywhere they go is going to be unevangelized. Okay, sure. Um, number three, Paul performed physical working for physical work, tent making, to sustain missionary work. Similarly, in the in the commemorative volume, Nava and Ocampo worked the fields of Yuma to sustain missionary work. And they mentioned that they do physical work. Okay. Paul performed thaumatur thaumaturgical wonders over a, that should be the body of a severely infirm man in Acts 14. It's the man of Lystra. And I'll, I'll tell you about his uh, condition here in a second. Similarly, in the volume, Nava performed healing over his severely ill sister, Guadalupe Sanchez, right? Acts details the unfortunate extent of sickness. The man in Lystra is described as, quote, impotent from his feet. He was sitting, crippled since his mother's womb, and thus had never walked. You have this sort of belaboring of the extent of this very advanced cancer, right? The unfortunate extent of sickness. Sanchez had a very advanced cancer to the extent that her face had been disfigured. Okay. I think there's still more to it. Importantly, we have the consequence of the healing. So the spectacle or the miracle gone public. In Acts 14, 11, and 12, when the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. We saw in the reading the spectacle, miracle gone public, because of this testimony of the power of Christ. Many people believe the apostolic doctrine. And my key takeaway is, here you have the 20th century apostolic farm workers, and they imagine themselves as living out the history and mission of the first century apostles. But there's more. Um, shortly after this, um, it's recorded in the autobiography, and as well as the, um, the Jubilee volume, commemorative uh, Jubilee volume, that Nava was given an offer. He was given us, someone offered him a, 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 um, a plot of land to build a church. This is 1919, folks. Um, this movement, this denomination, will later become a denomination, doesn't get its own proper brick and mortar temple until 1924. So this was a very fetching offer. But that uh, offer was divinely countermanded, continued the Acts of the Apostles, the Calexican call, so from Nava's autobiography. He wrote, a recently converted brother declared that he desired to give a plot of land so that a temple could be built, and we received it with joy. But amidst the process, the Lord gave me a vision, and in it he said, go to the Imperial Valley to Calexico, help them. Now, for folks who have some familiarity with um, the book of Acts, especially chapter 16, this is going to ring a very familiar bell. The Macedonian call. I'll read it. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Nava preached to Mexicans. Paul preached to Macedonians. Um, again, it's clear he's taking a page out of the Acts of the Apostles um, in telling and fashioning, later writing their own history, right? But, it's, but there's more to that. So Nava's first convert in Calexico is a woman, Maria Herrera. Interestingly, she is described as sort of like the, the, the main convert, right? And when Paul goes to Macedonia, it's Lydia who is converted. Again, the fact that both these st st stories center around the conversion of a woman is quite interesting. And there's also details to this, right? Maria, uh, the, um, the historical account recorded that her entire household was converted and also records that Nava was teaching her Bible studies from the book of Acts. Lady of Macedonia, one of the memorable features about that whole story is that the whole household is converted and each becomes a hub for the early um, movement. And seeing this repeated over and over in the Acts of the Apostles, or the, the Acts of the Apostolicos, is an example of what I call scripturalized narratives. It's how marginalized communities tell their history in conditions of asymmetrical power relations. And also that those stories take on a scriptural kind of quality, right? So Nava is revered as the patriarch of the movement. And that is not without the historical writing and all this kind of lore that develops around Nava. Okay, many more stories to share around that, but I must move on. 
Chapter 2, Sacred Waters Baptizing the Church. In this chapter, um, oh, gee, I could say uh, a whole lot more. Um, but, so, again, I'll describe this a bit more in the next chapter, but in many cases, the apostolicos do not have access to baptistries in their own churches. Many cases are not even in churches, a proper brick-and-mortar church, right? So they don't have a baptistry. So where do they start baptizing? In the grower-controlled rivers, canals, and other kinds of irrigation channels to perform their most sacred rite. So as I mentioned earlier, these are oneness Pentecostals, right? They, they reject the teaching of the Trinity. They baptize in the name of Jesus. Um, the falling out of early oneness Pentecostals with the Assemblies of God in 1916 was over the question of baptism. So among the apostolicals and oneness Pentecostals, even to a large extent today, right? If you're to go into um, become a member of these churches, they would ask for you to be rebaptized. So if you've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they say, no, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus. So they're most they're important, right? This is the preeminent step of ritual. They take to the pesticide polluted waters for their purifying ritual of baptism, a place where their sins are forgiven happens in this sort of context. So you notice in the photographs here, groups gather, right? Um, in other photographs I have, there's a guitar that's present. Um, people will bring, again, different kinds of instruments and, and tambourines. It's what um, scholars of religion refer to, again, the singing, the kind of uh, the emotion that, that's engendered by the, the clapping, the singing, again, the, the crying, the worship, the very demonstrative and exuberant Pentecostal worship, collective effervescence. So I suggest in this chapter that uh, baptisms in these outdoor settings um, assume multiple layers of sacred resistance. So these uh, baptismal sites were not meant, I mean, sorry, the, the canals aren't meant for human recreation, right? You can, you can see those signs still today. Of course, you'll catch people still fishing there. Um, I'm guilty of, of fishing in, in the California aqueduct, which that's not actually illegal, that's fine. Um, and so they, they take to the, uh, yeah, the canals to perform this baptism. And again, it's human recreation is outlawed in these sorts of places. And this is not where you expect to see a baptism. A man, Aniceto Ortiz, um, he shared with me his baptism. So this happened in Patterson. Um, this is uh, west of Modesto. He told me in Patterson, up in the canyon, there was water running at times after the rain. And it would form puddle, uh, puddles in troughs of sorts, troughs of puddles enough to cover the entire body. Now, that's my translation uh, based on, on the Spanish. But opportunities in this case rained down on apostolicos and the systems of canals and ditches harvest or it, it harnessed this um, heavenly outpouring. And this kind of uh, account, so where Aniceto Ortiz was baptized is the same place as the photo you see on the left. And this was not unusual. This is actually quite common to be baptized outdoors and people wore their Sunday bests to these sorts of baptisms, right? Because this is the most sacred ritual. Okay, going to move on here to chapter three, sacred fields, building the church. Um, the photograph on the left, it's uh, Josie Hernandez and Jeannie Manzano at the Driscoll Strawberry Farm in Escalon, California. So that's uh, near Modesto. Driscoll, Driscoll strawberries, right? Chances are if you had a strawberry, it's probably Driscoll strawberries. Even out here in Western Massachusetts, um, the strawberries and, and blueberries and uh, raspberries, they're mostly Driscoll uh, berries. So Jeannie Monsanto shared with me reflections of living in this, um, in the uh, Driscoll strawberry uh, farm in Escalon. And uh, this is a chapter uh, where I document the building of the churches, the actual kind of uh, uh, involved physical labor. In this chapter, I examine how how, where migrants physically worked the land, yet never owned these vast farms, they found opportunities to build their own churches. Temples, because many of them did not have permanent housing, right? They didn't own permanent housing. Temples offered migrants a sense of permanency in a context denying, designed to deny them any sense of belonging and you know, designed to keep them uprooted. And in the building of these temples, we can observe a really robust offstage social existence. Again, ways that these uh, communities that are disempowered find ways of making meaning in their own sort of separate, um, isolated areas. So in the construction of a brick, of, of an adobe brick uh, church in Sanger, Sanger being near Fresno, um, 
I see the sort of sacred resistance on full display. So I'm going to contextualize for you this quote that Jeannie Manzano, uh, you see in the photo, seated there on the right in the back of the truck. She shared with me her reflections about growing up in Singer. And she remembered from the quote, they started, you know, making this hole and hauling the dirt with the wheelbarrow and making the adobe. And then the pit got bigger, you know, it got bigger. And we didn't have no place to gather to have services. So they had the services in the pit, but the pit was deep and it was getting big. And we had benches, homemade benches. The more dirt they hauled out of there, the bigger the pit. And that's how we started. And I heard someone say that the neighbors around us called us los topos or the gophers. So you can imagine, this is a, again, um, a gathering, sacred gathering site, right? Dug out of the ground in hopes of eventually building a, a brick and mortar temple. Until then though, they had a tarp that was placed over it. And think again, these very demonstrative Pentecostal services where people are dancing and weeping with their hands raised and so on. Um, the top of the tarp, right, kind of billow. And after the church services, they would emerge out of the ground as topos or as gophers. But again, it kind of became a term of pride. So this is during the high tide of xenophobia, as I noted, um, or a high tide of xenophobia in the uh, late 20s to the uh, late 1930s of the Mexican repatriation. So on the left is the groundbreaking ceremony for this church in Sanger. And on the right is the Sanger church that actually still stands today as an apostolic church. Um, a truism that went around in the brickyards of Los Angeles, as noted by one historian, is the idea the color of brickwork is brown. So what did the making of adobe bricks look like at this time in California? It was extremely alienating work. If you could think of kind of the idea, right, the alienation of labor. Someone makes a part of a product, that's it. That's, they don't see the end product. There's no sort of pride in, in, in making of the object. In the case of adobe bricks, they're made in a brickyard. Uh, again, a site rife with exploitation in Southern California. The bricks are shipped off site. And then you, this is how you get the sort of whole um, makeover of Southern California that has so many adobe brick churches or a brick uh, adobe brick churches as well as um, adobe brick buildings in the style of what they call mission revival architecture, right? Um, Taco Bell, right? It's kind of notorious for this um, uh, mission revival architecture. UC Santa Barbara has something like it um, all throughout LA, even at a rest stop on the way to San Diego. Again, very familiar architecture. Now, I was quite struck to the degree that the Mexican farm workers took this idea into their own hands to build dignified temples. So you have here in the case of Delano, there we go, right, 661, um, Kern County. The man seated here um, on the left, uh, Pilar Moreno, he actually, um, he uh, got some training in Bakersfield. And um, his training was uh, with a man who was an architect, and initially it was building houses. So Folks from Bakersfield, you might be familiar with the really beautiful um, adobe brick homes around Oleander, right? Maybe. Um, he had a hand in actually building some of those houses. And so this is a talent that he cultivated and eventually started building these kind of adobe brick churches. So I have a picture of the one in Delano here, but he also built one that still stands today in Bakersfield. And... Um, Again, kind of background to that church in Bakersfield, the early baptisms happen in the Central Canal in Bakersfield that goes right through downtown. So, yeah, Bakersfield is, is no small part of this uh, book. All right. Uh, in the interest of, of time, I should continue on here. <clears throat> some of them, some of these congregations didn't eventually again, realize a brick and mortar church. So they worshiped in these sort of makeshift churches these carpas or tents, right? Or sometimes they call them tabernacles. And it was in these tabernacles, right, were not really meant to be permanent, but they kind of became more permanent than they were temporary. You know, these are kind of, they're just uh, basically, in some cases, like you have on the left, right? Some wood siding with a tarp kind of thrown on top. But the picture on the right has one of a proper tent. And that was in the middle of a farm labor camp. And this is the kind of place, again, where they worship because they didn't have the resources for their um, brick and mortar uh, temples. Now, you must be asking the question, well, you know, when they built these churches, how did they get the funds to build churches? Then it's the question that I ask. And the question I heard quite a bit was, well, the tamales, that, you know, it's because of tamales, that's where they're able to build the churches. 
But I beg the question, who made the tamales? And I found out, um, basically everyone I interviewed said, it was the women of the church who made the tamales. So I, I, I captured this exchange between uh, Maria and Aniceto Ortiz. Maria starts off tamales for the building of the church. Aniceto, todos los fines de semana. Maria, every weekend. Aniceto, every weekend made tamales. Maria, every weekend. And they would sell them, and they did them door to door or by relatives. And sometimes we wouldn't sell them. We made them so we we, um, we made so many that we decided, okay, each one of you is going to sell uh, five dozen. You put a goal. This um, the the pervasive model of tamales. I mean, it got very sophisticated in some places. In uh, in Salinas, as you'll see here on the photo on the left, you have women and the tamales truck. Um, they had a truck just to deliver. Deliver the tamales, right? There's a sense that it's made fresh. They delivered to the local community. They supplied tamales even for restaurants, right? So the restaurants were making known. This is a very labor-intensive process. And um, one thing I was quite struck by in the writing of this chapter is, if you're going to do a material history of this movement, it is squarely a uh, it's squarely women's history, and you don't have the elevation of men to status, you know, as preachers, as pastors, as leaders in districts and sectors and so on without the labor of women who are behind the scenes uh, doing this kind of work um, day in, day out. And I, it's more than just physical work, right? So first glance, you think, okay, there's kind of, you know, an economic engine. It's kind of an economic engine to the church. Yeah, but it's more than just that. Um, I found one quote here in, um, in, in a commemorative volume for the women's auxiliary. God would give great blessings and the Holy Spirit would be poured out among them to such a degree that even though that in those moments our sisters were to be about their work in the kitchen, they would glorify the Lord full of joy, and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit would fall. And with all liberty, they spoke in tongues, and they would continue performing their work like this. So it's more than just economic work. It's also, or more than just an economic engine, right? This is also ground zero for spiritual socialization in which, you know, in, in Pentecostal belief, the Holy Spirit would be poured out on them, and they continue to make them honest, um, even being under uh, this divine influence. Um, actually, let me back up. Just I'll say about this real quick. Um, historian Vicky Ruiz uh, describes a very fascinating phenomenon uh, in the canneries um, in California. Of, again, women working primarily in the canneries, the cannery culture, she describes, where women are working next to each other for hours on end. And they work for each other, or sorry, working with each other for so long, they broach all sorts of conversations of life, fashion, fads, family, who they're going to set up their sons with, who they want to set up their daughters with. There's nothing, right, that's kind of uh, not discussed in these contexts. And women in, 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 in the kitchens here in making the tamales built up a similar kind of socialization system where they're talking about all things about life. Uh, critically assessing the decision made by the male counterparts, discussing the preaching in ways that specifically relates to them. It's, um, again, it's economic, it's spiritual, it's social. And again, another material element, uh, it's tweaking the metaphor of sowing the sacred from the title of the book to a different kind of sowing. They also beautified these temples uh, with handmade goods. So they didn't buy into sort of the, 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 um, the trend at the time of what historians call Christian kits, right? mass-produced items that you kind of just hang up in your church. These are handmade goods, and they sought to beautify the temples with the work of their hands. So women not only generated the funds for the churches, they also made these denigrated spaces, right? These tents that aren't even sort of proper churches, according to the opinion of many at the time. They made them look holy and sanctified, and that's another way that they sowed the sacred. Okay, last chapter here. I'm going to wrap it up soon. Um, Sacred nostalgia, remembering the church. So this chapter takes three material processes. Number one, sounds, so music. Sights, S-I-G-H-T-S. -S, um, that's the kind of sights. Let me move this bar over here. Uh, yeah. So sights, S-I-G-H-T-S, dress. And sights, S-I-T-E-S. -E and so um, scholars of material religion point to the ways that material markers and material processes inform people's ideas and their memories about places that they once occupied. And so um, the sites, what I call the microcolonias, um, S-I-T-E-S, um, many reflected um, 
in, in the interviews that they really appreciated the sort of um, the strong com camaraderie that was built in, in these farm labor camps, right? Um, that the that people from the church banded together and kind of, you know, like a mutual aid society to some extent, right? Cooking food for one another, and they looked out for one another. So there's spaces in which they were able to uh, cultivate a sense of belonging, again, in this context that is designed to deny them that. Also sites, um, S-I-G-H-T-S, I was really struck uh, the extent to which interviewees shared with me the idea that women used to dress holier. And my idea of sacred nostalgia is not just like a general kind of nostalgia that's kind of pining for the past, but it's a pining or missing the past based on this idea that things used to be holier or things, again, economically weren't better, but there's a holier quality to the past. And one of them is they, they point to the way that women used to dress. Now, what I find quite striking about this is that women wore these long white tunics, they call them dusters, usually just for special services. So it's not like they wore this every day or to every service, but this had an outsized um, place in the memory of many of the farm workers. Uh, again, uh, this kind of sacred nostalgia, right? Things used to be holier. And finally, music, which I'm gonna give you one quick story about. Um, the the, the, the uh, material process of sounds Many, uh, so the earliest hymnal of this movement, uh, many of the hymns were written by the apostolic farm workers. And so it's no surprise, right, that they missed that the music that their predecessor or back then, their um, their brothers and their sisters, I would have called them, or their co-laborers in the field. This is a, the music that they had written. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna take you to a story. In, uh, oh, yeah, the photo on the left showing uh, one such orchestra from Tuleri when they're performing in Otay in 1934. We're going to move to and conclude with the story of uh, Chicano history's beloved son, Cesar Chavez. So in the quote I'm going to give you, it's in uh, 1954. Uh, Chavez was in Madeira, north of Fresno, helping a family with um, an immigration issue. So he was in the kitchen of, of a home of a pastor. And while he's talking to the pastor, and Chavez describes this in his 1975 autobiography, he describes that uh, the pastor got up and uh, he excused himself to go into the, uh, the living room. He said, I'll be back shortly. And then we have this reflection by Chavez. So the pastor got up, he went to the uh, church, uh, he went to the living room, and Chavez soon finds out it's a church. And here's his uh, quote. After they started their service, I asked if I could join them. So in that little Madeira church, I observed everything going on about me that could be useful in organizing. Although there were no more than 12 men and women, there was more spirit there than when I went to mass, where there were 200. Everybody was happy. They were singing. These people were really committed in their beliefs, and this made them sing and clap and participate. I like that. I think that's where I got the idea of singing at the meetings. That was one of the first things we did when I started the union. Uh, and it was hard for me because I could not carry a tune. Here we have uh, Pobrecito Chavez. He could not carry a tune. He couldn't sing along. Um, so um, I, I found it quite striking. Actually, I've written about this elsewhere. The fact that Chavez remembers this in, you know, in the 1975 autobiography, and he reflects on this important episode a whole 10 years, right? Almost about 10 years. Um, he starts the National Farm Workers Association first, uh, 62, but almost 10 years before all of that, and before sort of the very famous march right from Delano to Sacramento, he reflects on it was Pentecostals, the demonstrative worship, the singing, the clapping, you know, dancing, and so on. That's that's what he pinpointed to, and um, it's no surprise that my interviewees reflected on the music as a very memorable marker. So, what stories are portrayed about racialized Mexican? workers and a religious life, if we examine the photographs taken by the farm workers themselves. Um, plenty, it turns out. A photographic archive of actors and objects in the fields where Pentecostal labored broadens a typical idea of landscape. Apostolical or so-called stoop laborers, right, at the time, uh, some subsumed into larger landscape, spoke back a very robust counter narrative against assumptions regarding their supposed cult of vacuity, right? That they had no imagination, that they're birds of a passage, they're gonna go from one place to the next. Many believe that farm workers would leave no memorable mark as transient people. 
My book, Sewing the Sacred, shows, other, it shows otherwise. And despite industrial acts, exploitative profanities inflicted on the human bo uh, body and mind, Mexican Pentecostal farm workers re repeatedly demonstrated their personhood, fundamental desires, theological imagination, and artistic creativity by sowing the sacred. Their century-long history testifies as to how they reaped what they sowed. And on that note, I will say thank you. Um, there is the uh, discount code there. And again, thank you all for taking time to listen. And uh, Dr. Rosales, I will stop screen share. And um, suppose have you facilitate the conversation here? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Lloyd. That was totally amazing and wonderful on so many levels. And I would really encourage everybody to, to get the book <laughs> because you're really just scratching the surface of obviously what's in there. Um, uh, I will say for, for folks, uh, I know there's professors in the room, especially if you want to ask a question, just drop it in the Q&A, or I'm happy to also pull you in the conversation. But I want to go to one question that was already asked and ask a kind of follow-up to it. So um, Kelly Bravell asked, she said, how long did it take for you to write the book? And and, and to tell onto that, I, I'm, I, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about the photographs, because they are amazing. Like, it's just such this amazing archive that you generated and, and have put together so well. So can you talk about those two questions? Sure. Th thanks for asking, uh, Dr. Rosales. Um, oh, goodness sakes. I mean, I started the book in earnest. You kind of had an identified topic. Um, 2013. So in 2013, I worked with my academic advisor at the University of Michigan um, in acquiring two major collections we say major because they're huge collections. Um, <clears throat> one was from a um, a Pentecostal bishop in Mexico uh, and near Mexico City. His collection arrived in 2013. Um, it was about um, 80 boxes or so of material, well, ended up being 80 boxes of archival material. And then we also received a collection from a man, um, um, actually he's on the cover, Manuel Vizcarra. He's here on the, on the cover of the book, right? Starts off as a farmer in Salinas, and in the 1980s, he became the uh, the presiding bishop or the superintendent, the highest ranking elected official of this denomination, which by the 80s is a rather large denomination. Um, <clears throat> he became uh, yeah the, the, the uh, presiding bishop in the 80s. And prior to that, he's in, in the Central Valley. He's actually in Bakersfield um, in the Central Valley from the 60s to the 70s. And uh, we, we got his collection. Um, his daughter donated, his daughter Milka uh, donated the collection to Fuller Theological Seminary. I didn't go to Fuller. I didn't work for Fuller, but I was a PhD student looking for archival work. And I went to UC Berkeley, didn't quite find the stuff I was looking for. I got eventually one line that's in the book. Um, I went to UCLA archives, got one line from the book. It's where the, um, the demographers are asking um, Arvin residents, who is your doctor? And the man answers Jesus. There's like you know not not great uh, healthcare access at the time, <clears throat> but um so so yeah uh, Mirka donated the the collection and by the end of it we had over two hundred feet of archival boxes, and so I helped with processing the collection earned good faith and good trust, and um, after that I Mirka invited me actually to a funeral um, in um, in Patterson just um, west of Modesto. And she says, Lloyd, I know it's weird to invite you to a funeral, but just come. Uh, that's where you're going to meet everyone. So she started connect, uh, uh, connecting with other folks. And it kind of started to snowball, you know, where, you know, one person would refer you to the other. And, and ultimately, I did uh, 24 interviews and um, consulted well over 100 photographs. And so one thing I had to work out with the publisher was um, initially, I think they're offering to include eight images. And I said, no, 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 no. The, to tell this history, it's it's a story that's told through photographs and oral histories. And so eventually got them up to 34 images. I think about two of those are maps. So the other 32 are photographs. And um, yeah, all, all in all, it took about from 2013, again, started writing research in 2013. Um, my, my dissertation project was actually a comparison of the Oki Dust Bowl migrants, Pentecostal farm workers, and the Mexican Pentecostal farm workers. But Upon completing the dissertation, it was pretty clear to me that before doing the comparative project, I need to tell the Mexican Pentecostal story. So maybe that's something for, you know, in the future down the road. And so th this book, in earnest working on it, um, 
after I defended my dissertation, so 2016, and I submitted it in 2021, but I had done a lot of research prior to that. That's a long way of answering the question, but no, no, I don't want to discount the long for students, you know, especially those who are you may be getting ready to transfer or who are yep. four year, just kind of seeing about your research process. There are more questions coming in, so I definitely want to try to address those. Uh, Carrie says, I I'm really fascinated with the comparison between Paul and Brother Nava. Is, is that in the book so she can follow more closely that, that line? Yes, absolutely. A lot of comparisons. So Nava writes very freely in his autobiographies, and there's also, again, biographies of, of Nava. <clears throat> And there are comparisons in the book of Acts. There's ways he compares himself, I think, to kind of um, the way that uh, John, who writes, um, you know, the, the author of the book of Revelation, who kind of talks about his whisking away into the heavens and kind of these grand, um, majestic sort of visions of the heavens. He has something similar. Um, Navas calling to the ministry. It's, it's a page out of um, Acts chapter nine, where Paul is called into the ministry. Paul gets called to the ministry. Again, he falls off a horse and is blinded, kind of has a, a, a vision of sorts. He gets sick afterwards and is healed. Same thing happens with Nava. So, yeah, there's plenty of those, and those are in chapter one. Okay, we have another question from uh, Vida Diana who says, um, you know, what if you had to pinpoint a moment, like, wh what's the inspiration for the book? Is there, like, a kernel that, you know, outgrew this, this project? Great question, great question. One of them was... The realization that um, two things. So one of them is looking at photographs through the Farm Security Administration, the Office of Wartime Information, the Resale Administration, basically, um, you know, 1930s, 1940s projects. And the photographs, there are, again, you do get photographs of Mexican workers. The majority of them, they're silhouettes. They're stooped over. They're kind of subsumed into the landscape. And you don't see the up-close kind of saturated look, look, right, that you get with the migrant mother. And I couldn't help but to think, again, what's going on here with the Mexican workers? There has to be more to this. And I started reading a bit in um, uh, farm labor history in California, reading some labor history, and also reading Chicano history, right, where farm workers make, you know, they're, they're a big part of, of that history. And I couldn't help but to wonder, you know, there is certainly a, a life. Again, not to discount any way whatsoever the exploitation. It's rife and it's everywhere. But there's way that people will find meaning making, and in this case, through through religious means, even in terrible contexts, right? People will still do that. And it's one thing that we learned in American religious history that, yeah, it's the, the context can be terrible, but religion often uh, provides a, a meaning making system for life, all of its, um, you know, a bad hand one might inherit. Um, so that's part of it. And also, um, reading some literature from the 1940s. Again, we might think of it like his primary source now, but there's a UCLA um, professor, a UC Berkeley professor who did interviews with some of the migrants. And I was quite fascinated with little snippets they're catching. And the book opens with a scene um, juxtaposing uh, Walter Goldschmidt, who was a, a sociologist at UCLA, right? His drive from Wasco to Arvin, he compares two communities. Um, and I, I juxtapose that with a drive about a decade later by one of the Mexican bishops. They have two very different visions of what religious life looks like in the Central Valley. For Walter Goldschmidt, um, he has what he calls this denominational stratification, right? So you have like your upper crust, if you will, of it, um, to kind of borrow his geological metaphor, right? Um, you have your like your congregational churches, your Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches. And he said like lower down on the social strata, you have your Nazarene holiness churches. At the very bottom, you have Pentecostal churches. And he also says the African-American churches, because they're, they are so uh, segregated and relegated to the, to the margins of society, they don't even make it into his denominational strata. And with Mexicans, I'll read that there, right? It's just, it's worse. It's, it's, it's almost unintelligible because of the Spanish-speaking churches. So I wonder, well, I know that the Mexican Pentecostals are there to do this history. Where are they in all this? How do we tell that history? So... I really care to do the hard work of recovering a history. And Dr. Rosales, I had a blast doing it. I really did. It was hard to kind of stop writing the book, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you had a good editor, right? They told you to stop. Well, I, I know, I, right? <laughs> I have a question that I, I have to ask. So yep. I, I was obviously um, glad that you mentioned Chavez at the end. And I read your article on the, uh, the march from Delano to Sacramento when that came out about how we sometimes forget their religiosity behind that. So I, I have a question sort of about that larger topic, but really it's, I guess, about 
um, I don't know, perceived tensions between C Catholics and, and Pentecostals. And I'm wondering if you've seen the movie, um, the documentary, uh, Adios Amor, uh, the Maria Moreno story, who was the first uh, Mexican farm worker, woman organizer in AWOC. We hosted her at Bakersfield College before oh, the pandemic wow. and had a really large screening. And I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people were intrigued by the fact that you had this, you know, this 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 oh. organizer who who kind of got removed from the farm worker movement and then had a twenty year career history as as a Pentecostal minister um, mm. and, and social justice was always part of her her mission. I, I was wondering if she had any relationships uh, with the Morenos that you talk about <laughs> in your story. But again, just throwing that out there because you know I, in the film, um, uh, Lori Coyle, the director. Kind of plays up a little bit the Catholic Pentecostal tension, and then you're you're quoting Chavez as saying how he was kind of inspired by 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 the, the you know the, the apostolico. So if you can comment on that, oh yeah, I mean Chavez was incredibly pragmatic, which he had to be. You know that's so it's in '54. It's the time he's working for the community service organization as an as an organizer. I mean you kind of just gotta in many cases you're challenging again all sorts of systems, but you're kind of going with the flow, right? And uh, that's Chavez's pragmatism kicking in. Um, the tension is thick. I mean, oof. Uh, some of the interviews I conducted, um, they told me about when their family or the person that I'm interviewing converted, that uh, there's um, ostracization in the family. So many, many people within the uh, of the family of you know those who converted into Pentecostalism felt like they like the person who converted kind of betrayed. Uh, betrayed their culture, betrayed um, Mexico, betrayed again La Virgencita, right? You kind of like a betray, a, a rejection of Catholicism for many was a rejection of the culture. And yeah, that tension plays out um, quite a bit in some of the personal histories and also um, in some of the uh, Catholic history as well, the area. So in, in most cases throughout the Central Valley, especially, um, the different uh, dioceses of the Catholic Church were were rather slow in rolling out efforts to keep Catholic farm workers, Mexican farm workers, in the fold. And so you had, in some cases, you know, the priest who would go out into the field and administer communion. But you know, when you're going once a week or maybe every other week, and then you're 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 alo working alongside these Pentecostals who are really intent on converting you, trying to you know, quote unquote, save your soul. Social pressure is in the kick in at some point, and there's yeah very obvious and explicit tension be between the two. Um, the um, Moreno collection I have, have yet to substantiate that, and I think the thread might not be around Chavez actually. So I, I wrote a chapter. Um, Oliver, our dear colleague uh, Felipe Nahosa, he edited a volume on um, with with two colleagues, Edward Gonzalez and Maggie Elmore, called Faith and Power, and I contributed a chapter to that one in which I talk about. From 1954 to 1956, um, Cesar Chavez, his uh, interaction with Pentecostal, so the one I, I, I end the book with, um, chapter five, I discussed that at length in that chapter. Then, you ready for this one? Reyes Lopez Tijerina in 1956, his interaction with these apostolicos in Salinas. So when Tijerina starts the Valle de Paz, right, that utopian community out in the desert in Arizona, a large number of the people he recruits are of this apostolical farm worker ranks. And the Herina comes in as a fiery preacher, um, you know, preaching these sorts of ideas that, you know, we all, all the men need long beards and white tunics. We got to dress like Jesus and look like Jesus. Um, yeah, the sort of first um, utopian effort, uh, you know, or we know of, right, of this extent, right, in Chicano history, it's filled with, 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 with really over uh, uh, bearing uh, religious zealotry, you could even call it that, right? They, they try to restore, or Tijerina is at the helm of trying to restore a vision of Christianity. And that is where actually there are, there's, Moreno, there's a Moreno family in the Tuleri Vicelli area um, that I have, I don't know if I'm willing to bet that the connection there, but I think it is, I have not been able to substantiate that one. So I did not include it in the chapter, but um, it's there. Um, he recruits them from Salinas. He recruits them from Visalia. They go back, try to recruit more family members into the Valle de Paz. But um, I talk about the episode of, of uh, Tijerin, actually, a little bit in Chapter 5. And that's where I think we might find it. But I'd love to compare notes with you. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for mentioning that. There's a couple yeah. other questions. I don't want to deny them. Sure. Uh, Alexandria asked, you know, 
across your book is there, is there one artifact that was like this this you know there's like one artifact it's like your favorite and then if you could just share you know what's your as an academic as a scholar or as a writer what's your favorite part about the research process mm -hmm. great um favorite object that's such a great question i mean there's tons of objects here right um <clears throat> i'd let me let me cheat and answer. Like, let me get two things, okay? Um, number one, I'd say this whole phenomenon of the Karpas or these sort of tent churches, right? I find the whole idea of it fascinating. Um, you'll see in chapter three, you know, these this is not a religious movement that is ever, you know, in the near future at the time, right? Gonna have a church in the middle of town, right? Right in the downtown, a prominent place where you usually find a Catholic church or kind of a mainline Protestant, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian church. That's not going to happen, but they replicate this the kind of the 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 layout of the church at the center in the farm labor camps, and so I just I find that fascinating. In the space where they're able to do it, that's what they do. So the kind of it's not one katapa in particular, but it's kind of just that phenomenon of that's a space that is looked down upon. Right? It doesn't present itself as a holy place, yet they make it holy. And that's, again, this kind of sacralized profane, right? They sacralize the most profane spaces to uh, facilitate their spiritual religious endeavors. Um, there is another object that um, really just got my wheels turning quite a bit. Um, and it's um, it's not one in particular, just the idea of the tamal, right? All the tamales. That one, um, I spent far too much time researching that one, but... Well, maybe I didn't, because I feel like I tell a really important story about it in chapter four. And by the way, there's like a, if you follow one of the paragraphs closely, you basically have a, you know, a recipe for making tamales. Um, it was, it's a much labor intensive process, right? They weren't necessarily buying all the masa pre-made, but that object itself, I found fascinating. So, um, you know, um, the, the research process, one of the things I liked most was um, talking to people about process. So what I mean by that is, Again, in the book, I had to turn to Chicano history, ethnic studies, um, religious studies, farm labor history, and also this field that we call material religion. And in that field, we're really concerned with, again, we think about religion, we think about like creeds and beliefs, the gods, does God exist? Does God not exist? Is evil? What is evil? Et cetera, et cetera, right? Scholars in material religion foreground the importance of material objects to understand religious life. So we can, we can say a great deal about people's rituals, beliefs, and practices by looking at the objects that they surround themselves with and that they fill their churches with. Um, it's uh, that that for me helped me to, to do this kind of history, right? So if I just focus on a history that we feel like is logocentric, right? Around like who's preaching, who's kind of in power, who's writing um, minutes or periodical. That's one, day, one way of doing history. But to tell a material history, it's a way of doing history to be inclusive of the voices of women, um, people of color, two categories of people who would not necessarily have access to be able to um, have their own periodical, right? So this is not like a well and um, financially endowed movement that can that has their periodical that's operating in there, sending them, you know, their their their, um, their monthly periodical um, around to the U.S. No, uh, material history is a way of speaking to um, the histories that would otherwise go ignored and have long got ignored. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's my favorite part is the nitty gritty of the, the material stuff. And yeah. I hope there's certain paragraphs in the writing itself where, you know, after reading the paragraph, you look at in your fingernails and like, oh, kind of take the dirt out of there, right? You're like, oh, I could feel where Barbara's going with this. I want you to kind of have that sort of sensory experience. It's one where I'm describing the kind of, I talked about how it smelled. Mm -hmm. um the kind of um the, the kicking up of the dust that would have happened um any of you who's told me everyone's you know in the, the one in um, patterson everyone smelled like tomatoes when they came in because you would go straight from working in the field straight into the church and yeah. it made no sense necessarily to shower because you're gonna get just as sweaty in this hot service in the central valley scorching sun yeah i mean i, I love also in one of the book where you have the diagram of the kind of setting within the camp but like so oh, yeah. These kind of alternative spaces that farm workers build for themselves that you can't find on on a map. <laughs> it's you have to be within the community to know it. Um, 
we're, we're running out of time, but I want to at least address uh, one of my better students, Charles. He, I think he wants to order the book. He, 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 can you get an autographed copy like somehow? So, you know, if, if maybe I'll put him in contact with you if that's, if that's possible. Yeah, that's totally fine. And then the last thing, what are you working on now, now that this thing is out? Like what's what's your next project that you're working yeah, on? Yeah, the next project. Uh, thanks for asking that. I really appreciate it. Um, but real quick to Charles's point, um, again, I spent a, a lot of time in Bakersfield in, in the summer. So Dr. Rosales, again, I want to meet you in person. Um, and I have your book I'm going to have you sign, which I already pre-ordered yesterday, actually. Um, so I'll bring that, have you sign it, and then we can do kind of a uh, exchange of signatures there. So next project, there's actually two things I'm working on. Um, no, they're now officially both under contract. Uh, one of them is a history of the sanctuary movement, the phenomenon of undocumented immigrants taking sanctuary in churches. I'm doing a, a religious history of it. It's called a refuge of resistance. And I'm looking from the 1980s to the present day. And the other project um, in line with, with what we we're just discussing, it's, um, it's titled Cesar Chavez, a Catholic social prophet. And it is a religious biography of Cesar Chavez. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have to talk more on the side. Uh, I, I'm a consultant for the redoing of the National Chavez Center's La Paz exhibit, and we are just redoing it from scratch. And the religiosity of the movement is a cornerstone of, of the narrative. So, I mean, just today I was like, okay, we're going to weave Pentecostalism in more. So I can't wait to see uh, what you're working on, man. This is so cool. Um, I, I, I get, I, I love being able to answer every question. A, a student asked a great question. What was the most difficult part of doing this? Like what, you know, what was unanticipated difficulty? Um, um, in, well, to answer the kind of the affective part of it, right? It's, um, realizing that by the, by the time the book was published in 2012, I was interviewing folks who were very advanced, of very advanced age and seeing that. Now I look at the list of interviewees and most of them have passed on. And that's a tough one, um, knowing I won't be able to get the book into their hand. I mean, along the way, I'd send them the articles, right, related to the book, I was quoting some of the material that they provided. That's been the hardest that, in that sense of it. But uh, the hardest part of writing it, um, I'd say it was um, uh, getting enough um, Sources. Uh, again, I had the pile of, of sources that came through uh, at Fuller Theological Seminary that helped process, but also the interviewees. So trying to match the interviewees with what I'm reading in a couple of autobiographies and biographies and commemorative volumes with the stuff in the archives, with the photographs, it, it's like bringing all those things together, right? There's a lot of sources because I had the, the, the resources um, uh, to, to to do the interviews and go and collect photographs. But the hardest part was identifying who had what. And in some cases, it's also heartbreaking that where I had gone to uh, to Larry to consult a collection. I had you know, flown from uh, Western Mass to, to uh, Sacramento, drove down to Larry and found out that one of the collections I wanted to consult had just been uh, repoed in a um, storage shed and loss of thousands of photographs in that. So um uh, yeah i guess the feeling of tragedy <laughs> yeah the feeling of scarcity of sources at times which by the end of it there was actually an abundance but there's times where i just didn't know if i'd have enough to work with and mm -hmm. people were really happy that uh i was doing this kind of history and um i, I felt honored and humbled to do so yeah some other student asked a question too if they order <laughs> your book about getting an autograph so i will just say to those students listening if you buy his book email me we'll we'll make the connection to to lloyd Parma. so uh, yeah we'll work it out the, i also dropped a link to your partner's uh book on weed oh, patch in the chat wonderful. so hopefully you know attendees can get that but uh but thank you so much lloyd for participating uh again this talk will be archived on our social justice youtube page and uh I hope, you know, maybe for your one of your next projects, we can bring you for a physical book talk, especially I'm super interested in both the sanctuary movement and the stuff on Chavez. So thank you. Dr. Rosales, thank you so much. It's been an honor. Folks, thank you so much for listening in. Um, yeah, this has been, I, honestly, I, can, I had a great time. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here.